Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Udegang. It's the show where we chat about business analysis and project management and the challenges and triumphs within those fields. It's inspiring, informative, and very much inquisitive. My guest today has experience in management consulting. He's also an agile coach. He specializes in business training and facilitation, personal development, and career transition coaching. He is founder and, and CEO of Oligie Consulting. Please help me welcome to today's show, joining us from Shanghai, China, Colin Thompson. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Marcus. Ni hao, ni hao, ni hao. I know you have, you have some experience yourself in China, so you know when I say ni hao, I do. I'm saying hello, hello, hello. Yes, ni hao ma, as they say. Oh, well, hen hao. <laughs> uh, I could try my, my Mandarin, but uh, not here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's terrible. How's that? How's that? I'm still working on it. Still working on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on it. All right. So you've, you've got an ex uh, extensive experience in IT, right? You worked as an IT director. Um, you also worked as an IT project manager at Howard University. You've had several roles at IBM in Shanghai, including a project manager and agile coach. So maybe I could start off by asking, how did you get into IT? And how did you move into the role of, say, project manager or management consulting? So I'll tell you, it's an interesting story. I'm, I'm going to give you the, the real story of how I got into IT. I was a freshman at Howard University, and I was a major. I was majoring in finance. And the reason was I had an older sister who majored in finance. And when she graduated, she got a high-paying job and bought a sports car. So I said, wow, finance is the way to go. However, my first semester at Howard University, I had an um, MIS class. Actually, intro, intro to um, um, information systems class. And my professor, Professor Oliver, I was so fascinated by the, 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 IT, the IT course. Growing up, my father always had computers. So we had computers in the house, but I was just fascinated by the nuts and bolts of it. And he convinced me my first semester to shift my major from finance to information systems. And I never looked back. And when I graduated, I graduated in 1995 which was a few years before the what? The year 2000, that's the year 2000, um, um, what we we'll call it? We called it the, um, I forgot what the term was. The Y2K I mean, thing? Yes, yeah, the Y2K yeah, thing. Yeah. And I became a Y2K consultant. Oh. And at the time it was very high paying. There were a lot of companies that wanted uh, uh, IT professionals to come in and help them solve the Y2K bug. So the world wouldn't blow up <laughs> from 1999, 2000. And I really re-embedded re myself into IT during that time. So I've always been a fan of disruptive technologies. And I love, I love IT. Nice. Very nice. Fantastic. Now, you worked as a project manager in Shenzhen, China, uh, with IBM's integrated supply chain, the ISC. Can you, can you give us... Um, uh, can you sort of take us through your experience in that role? Like, how, how did you find it? Yeah, so when I was in Shenzhen, I was a department manager, not a project manager. Mm. But I, I, I um, started my project management life, I would say probably in, wow, probably 2003 mm. or 2002. And it was because as much as I loved IT, I was a terrible coder. I, I just, I just never, I never could get coding right. Um, in college, I had trouble with it. When I was working for Ernst and Young, you had to be able to code quick. I couldn't code quick, but they found that I was able to manage. So they moved me from being a coder to a manager. And at the time, manager meant being a project manager. So I got to project management um, in 2002. I did my the PMP in I think 2003, 2004. And I got to say that doing the PMP was very, very good because it gave me a, what I would say, a structure. Mm. It, it gave me a structure, a baseline. I could always refer to that framework to understand how to really manage different aspects of a project. And I'll tell you, that was very fundamental. But as you know, understanding how to manage people 
is much more important. And now, as I'm in my my gray hair time, I'm realizing that now knowing how to coach people who are on the project team is much more important. So I started project management, man, probably probably 20 years ago, 20 years ago. And I shifted because I stopped enjoying project management. I stopped, right? And let me tell you, when I first got into project management, what I loved about it was the project ends and you have another project, another project, another project. But then, then after years and years, I got frustrated because people, some people, some projects, a lot of projects just don't reach the project goal. And it has nothing to do with the project manager, nothing to do with the team. It's just to do with the environment. And I got frustrated and moved then into more team management, more, more, um, I would say, um, classic management, managing a team, and more into consulting. Fantastic. Yeah. Actually, talking about consulting, so you worked as a senior consultant at IBM in Shanghai, right, for the Asia Pacific region. And uh, from what I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it was for the global process excellence and ways of working team. And you, right. guide, you, yeah, you guided business teams in Japan, China, Australia, Singapore, all over the place, India. And you were basically executing these process improvement projects. And some, some of the projects included business process management, lean, lean, six sigma, and so on. How was, how was that experience as a senior consultant? How did you find that? It was, it was, it was tremendous. And I go back to... You know, when we, when, we, when we have a career, when we work, I think we have different lives or different, we go through different generations in our, in our working environment, in our working, um, in our working, working history. We, we go through different things. When I started being a consultant in AP, I was much more interested in building relationships with the people I work with. It was more about how can I help the individuals be more valuable in their work lives. Not so much, how can we save the company money? But if we're able to make individuals feel more valuable, they have more energy. They're more, they're more driven to work harder. So the company does profit from that. Okay. So it was great because I had, I had the opportunity to learn so much about culture mm-hmm. and working with people and how you, how you work with people from India very different from how you work yeah. from Japan, yeah. and very different from, people from, from Australia, and very different from, from people from Philippines. And understanding how to, what I say, put a different hat on, right, or put, put my different diversity hat on for individuals, it was tremendous. I learned so much about people, about culture, and by the way, we did a great job helping them be more efficient at work. When we talk about lean, lean six sigma. It's all about how to remove, reduce errors and be more efficient. So teaching folks how to do the job better, which makes them more valuable to the workforce, to the marketplace, and the work relationships was tremendous. Fantastic. Yeah, I know I, having worked with a few other uh, cultural groups, it depends. Sometimes there's a rigid structure and you can't go straight to the person at the top. You've got to go through the person just slightly above you, just as an, as an example. So, I mean, every culture is different, right? Uh, so you got to understand how those dynamics work amongst uh, every, everyone. Now, you 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 worked at um, I you worked with IBM in Shanghai, obviously as as, a, as an agile coach. What was your experience? Uh, any lessons learned for aspiring agile coaches out there? I think for aspiring agile coaches, if I had to if I had to say lessons learned was be patient with your teams mm-hmm. because most if 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 a team needs an agile coach as our trainer, as our consultant, it means that they're still learning how to work in an agile way. And sometimes with agile, you have to unlearn your, your previous way of working to, before you can adopt a new way of working. And it takes time. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, one good thing about agile, agile gives the team a lot of autonomy. It puts a lot of control into their own hands. And I'll tell you what, Marcus, some people don't want that. Some people, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Autonomy, no, not me. Right, right. Some people want the manager to tell them what to do. And I'll tell you why. In Asia, it's very difficult because people feel that if my manager tells them what to do and it doesn't work, then it's not my fault. 
Mm-hmm. But if I decide what to do and it doesn't work, it's my fault. And somebody else will get the raise. Somebody else will get the promotion. So people don't want that responsibility sometimes. So I'll tell folks, be patient because you really have to coach and guide your team on how to not just do agile, but how to be agile. And the second thing I'll say is continuous, continuous, continuous learning. Keep learning. Go to LinkedIn. Pay $30 a month for LinkedIn learning and learn. Take all the classes you can on LinkedIn or whatever platform, but continue to learn, continue to learn, continue to learn. Because Agile, it's not new. It's not new, but it's still going to new places now. Agile has moved out of this IT side, and now we have a term called business agility, which is really agile outside of IT. Nice. So if you, if you look back at the roles you've had, project manager, product manager, agile coach, management consultant, and so on, working in China, what are some differences between working in Shenzhen and Shanghai, you know, the north and south China, versus, say, working in the States? What, um, what, what kind of differences did you find? Well, I think the, the, the first difference that I experienced when I first came to China in 2008 working in Shenzhen was the fact that the workforce was just so young. Mm -hmm. If I look at the roles that the Chinese had here, even now in Shanghai, compared to the US, in the US, I was 34 years old when I I left the US. With IBM, I was the youngest person on a lot lot of my teams, Mm -hmm. youngest at 34. In China, I was the oldest, by Mm -hmm. I was one of the oldest. So it's very, very different. You have a lot of people who are younger assuming some of the same roles. You may have Mm -hmm. an accountant for you have your finance team, the HR team. In the U.S., HR HR teams tend to be older, people who have been in HR for for years and years and years. Here, you may have a manager who's early 30s, but her team is very, very young. So Mm -hmm. that's one thing I had to Mm -hmm. be aware of because when you go from being the youngest on a team to being the the oldest, (laughs) <laughs> it's very different how you communicate and the expe- expectations. Because when I was in my early 20s, I worked hard, but I may not have known how to work the right way. Now, being in my, not, not now, but at the time of my mid 30s, working with a younger team, I hadn't developed the patience to understand they might, might not know the right way. It was more of you need to, you need to, you need to. So, one of the things I had to learn was to was to take off my Western hat, take off my way of working from the U.S. and not try to push push that here in China because in China, it's more of, in Asia, excuse me, it's more of communication, more of less stress. It's, it's only work, it's not a whole life. Rather than the U.S., it's, this is work. You must work, do overtime, yada, yada, yada. So one of the first things that had to uh, be different was just the work culture where it's less... I want to say the focus here is not on work. The focus here is on, on family. And you have to be aware of that. Yeah, nice to know. That's, a, that's an amazing difference. That's really a, a, a vastly different dynamic. It's a different way of looking at things, right? Yeah. So, Let me say yeah. That, it was very difficult, though. Let me say it, it was very, my first two years here was very, very difficult because if I was working on a project team or, or managing a team, and we had an, an issue or a, we had a, a, um, a complaint and we have to figure out what is the problem here. If it's 5, 5 p.m. and we haven't figured it out yet, we're going to stay there until we resolve it. But here at 5 o'clock, people go That's home. It. You go. That's you it. know, <laughs> I, <laughs> that reminds <laughs> me. I was, at the ba- I was at my bank in China in Beijing when I used to live there. And I wanted to transfer some money to Canada. And I went in at quarter to five. And they took me to the guy who was going to make the transfer. He looked at me and said, we're closing at five. Uh, what? Because I know it takes an hour to transfer this money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nope. Sorry. See you tomorrow. I mean, this yeah. is considered poor customer service in Canada. Nobody will stand for this stuff. But uh, you could even get fired for telling you kicking a customer away. But no, in China, perfectly acceptable. Yeah, five o'clock, we close. Yeah. Sorry, man. Yeah, and I've, I've been there and they'll, they'll tell you, they'll say, it's not us, but the system shuts down automatically at five. 
What can ah, they do, right? Okay, but but you know, but for a lot of organizations here, you have to understand that a lot of employees take a bus to work, hmm. okay? Because they live so far out, or they take a bus to work, so the bus leaves at five oh five. If that bus leaves, then they have no way home. Yeah. So everything shuts down at five o'clock in the U.S. We stay there until we solve the problem. Yeah. And my view was these employees don't want it as much as the company wants it. Mm-hmm. So I had a very I had a tough time those first two years. And I'll tell you what, I actually stopped being a manager mm-hmm. in China because my style wasn't the best for the environment here. Now I'm, I'm a much now I'm a much uh, more empathetic um, manager and leader, but back then. I was much, it was much more of, you know, what's it called, friction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> much I more friction. Imagine. Yeah, I would imagine. But, 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 yeah, but a lot of Westerners come here thinking that the way they work in Europe, Australia, the U.S., South America, Canada, they come here with that management style, mm-hmm. and they think people here should adopt that management style, and it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. It does not work like that. You have to really understand the culture here and say, how can I, how can I uh, um, adopt or customize my style to really work here. And it takes people a long time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and as also as a foreigner, you don't have the same privileges. So you can't, you can't say and do certain things without uh, being ostracized or being you know, pointed out. And a local pr- could probably get away with, with a bit more things than, than a foreigner could too. At least I found that when I was here, when I was there. Yeah. Uh, I actually found the opposite. I actually oh. felt that being a foreigner and maybe because I even have a big name, but being a foreigner, you can do more things. Um, oh, okay. people, people treated Westerners as if they were very important people, VIPs. Hmm. And I found I got treatment far and above what a local person would get many times. Wow, interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's interesting. Maybe it depends on the maybe it depends on the on the job you have too. Who knows? Yeah, but, and yeah. you in Beijing, though. Beijing, Beijing is very different for foreigners. Yeah, yeah. It's a different slice of bread, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Now, now you run a the consulting company, uh, Oligie. I'm trying to pronounce it properly. Uh, Oligie Consulting. Oligai. Oligai, yeah. Sorry, Oligai Consulting, yeah. right? And yeah. uh, can you give us a, an overview of what types of services that Oligie, uh the consulting provides? Yeah. So Oligai is my is my baby. I started all the, the first iteration of Oligai when I was in college. Um, doing giving giving loans well i can say this now giving giving loans with very high interest rates i mean i'll give you on friday i'll give you fifty dollars on monday you got to give me back like sixty dollars right mm-hmm. and if you're late by the way i have your i have your, 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 your computer monitor in my room if you're late we're adding ten dollars a day so that was the first iteration of it okay i can't say that was too legal but you know it's been 30 years now yeah. um that was the first iteration um second iteration was years later when i made I made passes for Howard University homecoming. Um, you have your, your passes you wear around your neck. If you think about going to a conference and they have your conference badge, mm-hmm. I made those um, for, for homecoming. Um, and then the next iteration was three years ago when I left IBM and started my training, consulting, and coaching business. On the consulting side, I have clients, I mainly do a lot of agile consulting, agile mm-hmm. coaching, agile training. Also now, just based on the need to pivot. And as you know, any business owner who does consulting needs to be able to pivot, needs to be able to understand what people want. Mm-hmm. And from last year, the, the major pivot I saw is in a couple of areas. People wanted less of the hardcore training. Agile is a framework. People want a training on soft skills. How do I help my team to have more grit? How do I help my team to have more collaboration? So you think about design thinking, you think about looking at things from the, from the, from the customer perspective. But the biggest shift from, from last year has been in diversity and inclusion training. Mm. So I made a big pivot last year to really just like I, the advice I gave to young agile folks, mm-hmm. training, 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 to understand, go online and take training to understand how to provide my, my clients with what they need. Diversity and inclusion. Right now, 
diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism, discrimination training is big. It's big, big, big. A lot of companies want this. Well, a lot of companies feel they need to ensure mm -hmm. that the employees are trained on it. And that, that's great. That's great. But that, that does nothing. I'll tell you that, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Training your employees on diversity and inclusion does nothing unless you have an environment where you have diversity and inclusion. Because okay. training just means we're checking a box, mm -hmm. right? Checking a box. It doesn't mean we have an environment that supports that. So, so right now, I'm doing a lot of traditional um, hard skills, agile training, leadership, leadership training. We're also now doing the soft skills, diversity and inclusion training, anti-discrimination training. So it's, it's, been, it's been varied, but I think being, having the ability to understand what the clients want and having that skill set. Because if, you, if, you, if the client says, hey, Colin, can you do this? I'll say, give me a second. Yes, I can. <laughs> right? And then go learn it. And then go learn it. So uh, bringing up training actually is pretty good. So say if someone wants to, any recommendations for personal development apart from training? Uh, say, say if someone wants to uh, develop personal development, you know, so once someone wants to put into effect personal development, they want career transitioning, say, into project management, agile coaching, management consulting, anything else apart from training that they should look at? Well, I say when you go to personal development, I do that on the coaching side because I also do coaching. Okay. And personal development, I think that is a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, you can do that in a team environment, but typically in a team environment, each person has a different sort of personal development goal or need. So for personal development, it's, it's better to do that one-on-one. -on -one. one person may need to understand how to um, be able to manage relationships better. Mm -hmm. One person may need many coaching on how to increase the confidence. One person may need coaching on how to speak out in public. So it, it, varies, it varies for each individual. So we do, so I do do a lot of personal development coaching and, um, if you're going to be actively wanting to, to, to transition into agile coaching, um, make sure you want, you want to do it. <laughs> and I say that because anytime you make a career transition, I would hope that you're doing it to go to your dream career, your mm -hmm. dream job. I, I love agile. I love blockchain. I'm not sure, though, personally, that I would say those are my dream jobs. And I coach people, if you have the opportunity to go into your dream job, whatever that may be, make sure it's what you want to do for the rest of your life. Make sure you love it. And once you identify what it is you want to do, don't ask yourself how. Don't worry about how. Just ask, what do you want to do? If you could do any job, what do you want to do? And once you identify that job, then start looking for people who you know, who, who you know who've done that job. Research them. Research them. And once you research them, find out how they got there. And then do your research. Find out what, what companies offer these things. Just do your research. But you first have to identify what do you really want to do and then do an honest, keyword here, an honest assessment of your skills. What is the gap that you have to be able to get a job in that area? You might have to go back to school. You might have to take a lot of online training. But again, do an assessment. Understand what the gap is. Find people who are doing it and get some mentoring, get some coaching, and start taking that gap you have and making it smaller, 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 and then go after that job, that career. I like that advice. Now, you, you mentioned actually blockchain. You recently, you worked recently as a director of global operations for two blockchain companies, and you're also co-founder of Xchains, which is also a blockchain company. What's What's been your experience with blockchain in China? Well, those ex exchange is not a blockchain company. Okay. Um, we are we we have an online learning platform that's powered by blockchain. Oh, okay. And I say that because we use blockchain, but it's not it's not it's not our umbrella. Okay. Um, my experience in block my experience in blockchain in China, it's um I don't know how to answer that in terms of in China because it's sort of like saying what's my experience with the internet in China. Mm. It's just it's the global, it's global, it's global. Mm. 
Um, but I can say, I can tell you that being here in China, I have, I have witnessed how China is embracing blockchain. And what will happen in China? China will say, we're going to build a region. We're going to have this maybe five miles by five miles square. In this five mile square, we're going to put all the blockchain companies. Okay. And we're going to give you money. We're going to give you employees housing. We're going to also give you some, some opportunities to bring in some foreigners, experts to work in here. Mm. And for the next, we're going to take two years to build it. And after that, for the next 20 years, this is our blockchain research hub. And they'll throw everything at that in order for, for China to have a, a strong understanding and capability in blockchain. So I know that they, that, that they and I don't see this in other countries, mm -hmm. okay? I don't see other countries. So I know China has embraced blockchain. I think the, the, the globe, globally, blockchain is still relatively small mm -hmm. because the use cases are there, but there hasn't been any company that says, I, we've been using blockchain for 10 years and here's the results. Mm -hmm. Most companies have got the blockchain maybe five years ago. It's been around longer than that, but it's still relatively young. And by the way, People, everyday people don't want to hear blockchain. They want to hear cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And cryptocurrencies is powered by blockchain. But folks don't want to hear about that. They want to hear about the cryptocurrencies. So I, I will say that China um, is embracing blockchain. And I, I think that I, I, like, I like blockchain because I view it as a potential disruptive technology. And I love technologies that disrupt the status quo. Nice. Very good. Any, any advice for uh, viewers out there who want to get in touch with you? Uh, how can they do so? Yeah, well, the advice I would give to get in touch with me would be just go, go to my website, um, oligye.com. Once again, it's oligye.com. From that um, jump off point, they can email me. They can schedule some time to, to meet with me. And also, more importantly, they'll find out my services my capabilities, and how I can help them to achieve a goal. This is for individuals, organizations. How you can achieve a goal uh, personally or as an organization, how you can achieve goals as well. So you can go to my website, reach out to me, and we can be in contact in as early as two weeks. Fantastic. Great. Well, thanks, Colin. This has been a fascinating uh, perspective and I haven't had anyone on the show yet to talk about China so that's uh, I think this is a really unique perspective at least uh, from a western point of view so thank you very much it's been splendid yeah my pleasure and let me just say this about China I know that you know growing up watching tv I used to see these views of different countries be it South America be it Africa be it Europe and all those views were false once I traveled there and I know right now there's a certain view about Asia, about China, about Japan, about the Philippines. And I would urge your, your listeners to experience those places. And if you can't get there, develop relationships with people who are from there. Because that's how you really understand what is real and what's not real. That's how you really understand culture versus what you're seeing on TV. So uh, I've been in China now for 13 years. And the people I've met here in China, I've met more people from Europe, from Europe and Africa than I ever have living in the U.S. And I've learned so much about the real side of people. And so I urge your audience, your audience to really start developing, developing relationships with people that are different from them. Advice. Yeah, very good advice. Fantastic. Well, thanks once again, Colin. It's been a pleasure. And right. uh, I'd say have yourself a great, fantastic, fabulous day in Shanghai. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, take care. And now a word from our sponsors. The Lewis Institute provides an enterprise project management program that does more than just train PMs. It helps support them from the CEO level on down. These courses help certify project leaders and prepare them to pass the PMP exam. The Business Agility Institute provides Emergence, the Journal of Business Agility. This quarterly publication brings you inspiring stories from the most innovative companies. Use the promo code ANALYST to get a 10% discount 
on your annual subscription. Thank you.